Good morning, my friends. I'm so glad you're here with me today. I'm just welcoming you. I am Pam Kerno. I am the teaching director of the Castle Rock Community Bible Class, and I'm so happy um, that we're able to get together and study God's Word together. I was uh, praying this morning, realizing that today is a glorious day. It's the Good Friday, the day that Jesus Christ took all of our sins on, 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 on him and took it to the cross. And from that, we are now forgiven of our sins. And so I was just saying to the Lord, Lord, I don't quite understand the, the, or comprehend really the agony that you went through on the cross, but I do understand. And I'm filled with gratitude of the victory of the cross. And so we will celebrate the victory of the cross with his resurrection on Easter Sunday. And no matter what's going on around the world, we will still praise God for the defeat of, of sin the gift of salvation, and the victory that we have in Jesus Christ. So welcome. Glad to have you here today. So now we are continuing our study in Acts 24. Um, in Acts 23, just as a recap, remember there had to be 475 soldiers that whisk Paul away from Jerusalem and brought him to Caesarea. So now he's held in prison in Caesarea in chapter 24. But we saw that before the uh, soldiers took him safely to Caesarea, Paul was beaten and discouraged in his cell in the barracks at, in Jerusalem. And at that moment, God appeared to him because it's but God, right? In our darkest moments, the moments of despair and discouragement, God appears. And God appeared and he stood beside Paul. And what does he say to him? He says to him to take courage. So we found last week that there is a sovereign hand of God. The sovereign hand of God protected and provided for Paul. And the sovereign hand of God protects and provides for us as well. So in the midst of this, God is still on his throne. He is sovereign and in control. And then we also saw because how uh, God appeared, Jesus appeared to Paul and stood beside him, that we know that God does the extraordinary when the ordinary is not sufficient. And I believe we're in times that the ordinary is not sufficient. And so I am expectantly watching the Lord do extraordinary. The anticipation within me just rises day to day. And I am just watching for those God moments, believing that God is going to do the extraordinary in the midst of this. So now we pick up in Acts 24. And in this, I kept thinking over and over as I was studying it, that what kept coming to mind was that there's missed opportunities, that, that we need to make the most of every opportunity. I've been really convicted of that for this time, for this season. You know, before this all happened, I had been praying, Lord, I sure wished I didn't have to go to work. Now I'm praying, Lord, please let me get to go to work. But it's so funny that in that time I was asking for that. And now in the moment, God has actually given me that, and I need to make the most of that opportunity. And so I've been really convicted in, in making the most of every opportunity. And as I was looking through Acts 24, I just saw different opportunities, opportunities to, to respond to divine opportunities, divine appointments, moments in time that God has given us. So I um, have an illustration. It's a little bit lighter illustration about a missed opportunity, and I'm going to read it. So if I'm looking over to the side and, you know, I'm looking at my notes, but um, there, it's a story about uh, Walt Disney when he was building uh, Disneyland. He actually approached a friend and he gave him the opportunity to buy up a huge parcel of the land that surrounded it. And it was just dry and dusty. It was just um, uh, scrub land, but it surrounded Disneyland and uh, Walt Disney knew that that um, property would increase in value. And so, but it was a small window of time. This man had to decide quickly, but the man said, well, I need, I need to think about it. I need to think about it. And so, uh, uh, Walt Disney went to someone else. He built Disneyland and that land grew, um, financially, um, uh, to great, great extents. So it may be, that God puts before us an opportunity. And there are times where we may fail to seize it. And that doesn't necessarily mean that we're out of the play altogether. Um, but it does mean that God will raise up someone else to do it. And so we want to be a part of God's blessing. I want to be a part of what God is doing and where he's working. Uh, Blackaby always says, watch where God is working and jump in. And we are watching God work in amazing ways today. And so we need to jump in. So we don't want to miss any opportunity. Let's make the most of the season where we are sheltering in place that God has intended for us to learn from this. So now we move into Acts 24 and we have an Acts. 24, starting with verses 1 and 2, 
we find that it's been five days that the high priests in Jerusalem have been preparing, preparing, <laughs> preparing their argument to present to the Roman governor, Felix. So they're preparing their argument. During that time, Paul is held in prison. And they hire a, a lawyer, which was a, he was a Gentile, and um, it would not be uncommon for them to hire a lawyer. What they were, were, they were a public speaker. They were a professional speaker. And so they hired this man. His name is Tertullus. And um, so they hired him to present the defense before the governor. Now, the Jews despised Felix. They did. But the uh, Churchillus, who was the lawyer, his opening statement was just full of flattery and pre uh, pretense. Um, but even as corrupt as Felix was, you've got to think that he probably had a suspicion that there was something up, that the Jews were wanting something. And it soon became clear, the motivation was clear, that what they wanted Felix to do was to call, uh, to determine that Paul was guilty so that he would be um, executed. And so now they brought three charges against Paul. And the three charges was the first one was sedition, which was troublemaking or rebellion. And this violated the Roman law. And this would have been carried with it the penalty of death. Now, secretarianism was when they accused him of being a ringleader of a sect. And this violated the Jewish law. And then sacrilege, which is desecration. And that violated God's law. And so Paul's defense uh, begins in verse 10, and let's just look at it together. It says, and when the governor had nodded to him to speak, Paul replied, and he, ad he addresses each one of these things in his um, defense. So the first one, when he talks about, um, let bear with me, let me get to my note. Uh, sedition or troublemaking, rebellion, violation of the, the Roman law, um, he was saying, uh, Paul says to them in response to that, he says, um, knowing that for many years you've been a judge over this nation, I cheerfully make my defense. Verse 11. Now you can verify that it's not been more than 12 days since I went up to the worship in Jerusalem. And they did not find me disputing with anyone or stirring up a crowd, either in the temple or in the synagogues or the city. So he deals with that first accusation right off the bat. He, as far as um, the stirring up trouble, he, he says to them, look, it's only been 12 days since I have been in Jerusalem and I can account for six of those 12 days. One of them, I was in prison in Jerusalem and then five of them, I've been held in prison in Caesarea. So in that time, could I have caused rebellion? Or trouble that was worldwide, because remember, Tertullus said that he had it was worldwide throughout the uh, the Roman Empire that he was causing trouble. And so Paul says, "There's no way I could have caused such trouble in the, that amount of time." In fact, when they found me, I was just in the temple, not causing any trouble at all. And so then the second charge, the one of being a, being a ringleader, he goes on to say. But neither can they prove, um, now verse 13, neither can they prove to you what they uh, now bring up against me. But I do confess to you, and this is verse 14, that according to the way which they call a sect, I worship the God of our fathers, believe in everything laid down by the law and written in the prophets, having a hope in God, which these men themselves accept, that there will be a resurrection of both the just and the unjust. So he says to them, he says, now, as, in regards to the second um, uh, uh, accusation that I am violating um, Jewish law, that I am building up a sect, he says, at first, he doesn't acknowledge that it's a sect. He says it is the way. He is the way. And that the way is actually, um, let me find it which they call a sect, I worship, the God of our fathers, which would be what um, the Jewish leaders would have uh, worshipped as well, the God of the fathers, believe in everything laid down by the law. So he acknowledged the law and written in the prophets. But he goes on to say, but I have a hope in God, which these men also accept. But that hope goes into the resurrection as well. So Paul is saying that I believe, according to Jewish law, I believe all of the law. That I believe all the law because I believe all the law. I love God. And so he's saying that really in defense that the Jewish leaders don't love God because what do they do? They reject the truth of the law. They don't believe all of the, the law because the prophets 
prophesied of Jesus Christ, the son of God coming down and he was the Messiah. And so they are not uh, believing those things. And so they don't believe the whole law. So Paul says, I do. I embrace the whole law. You and I as believers, we believe in the entirety of the scripture from the beginning to the end. This is God's revelation. It is complete. It is inerrant. It is the word of God. And we believe it. And we believe it for teaching, for understanding, for wisdom, for reproof. Um, it is also gives us the understanding of the sign of the times, of the things that we are seeing happening today. And so Paul says, I believe in the whole word of the law of uh, uh, the law and we say that as well we believe in the entirety of the scripture the new testament all uh, the old testament all the way through the new testament so then the last one was sacrilege it was desecrating the the temple and that is a violation of god's law and paul says absolutely not did i do that and let's pick that up and see what he says exactly he says in verse 16 so i always take pains while well, this is goes back into having a clear conscience towards um, both god and man but in 17 now after several years I came to bring alms to my nation and to present my offerings. He is, he loves the Jews. It is his nation it is his, his, his history. It is his tradition. And so he comes to present offerings. And when he is doing this, they found me purified in the temple without any crowd or tumult, but some Jews from Asia, they ought to be here before you to make an accusation. Should they have anything against me? So let's stop there for just a second. Let's go back and look at that. So what he's saying that he says, I have been gone from Jerusalem for a long time. And so I come back to the temple. Now we remember back in uh, uh, chapter 23 um, or prior to that, that the, um, when Paul came back to Jerusalem, he was bringing an offering to the Jewish Christians because they were, it was a hardship for them at that time. And he had collected an offering and he wanted to present this offering to them. And when he stood before the Jewish leaders in Jerusalem, um, the believing Jewish leaders, they said um, that um, there was a concern that there was disunity between the uh, Jewish Christians and the Gentile Christians. And so they, they suggested that in order to to build up unity that Paul would sponsor some men who had taken the Nazareth vow. Now, Paul understood that. So he understood that at the end of the Nazareth vow, they would present an offering in the temple. Usually it was the hair that was cut and there was uh, something else often that was presented as well. Um, and so they would present that in the temple. And Paul knew that he had been in Gentile territory. So during that time, he was in Gentile territory. He now needed to be purified. He needed to be cleansed to be in, in order to go into the temple. And so he had gone to the temple for a purification. So he was following the laws. And so when he left from there, he had done nothing wrong. They accused him of bringing a Gentile into the temple, which was not the case. And so they, um, and it was the uh, Asian, the Jews that were from the Roman uh, providence of Asia. And they had followed or been in Jerusalem as well. And they made those accusations. And so Paul says, if I am being accused of something, then where are those eyewitnesses? Why are not they, why are they not standing before you and giving you the testimony of what I have done wrong? So he addresses the violation of God's law as well. Um, so we find in this section, when if I go back and I think about making the most of every opportunity, we have once again the Sanhedrin, the re Jewish religious leaders, hearing the truth of gospel, the testimony from Paul. They are hearing the testimony once again. And, and that testimony, that divine opportunity for them could have been for them to say, hey, wait a minute. Why are we accusing Paul? Paul has done no wrong. And caused them to look again at the scriptures and see that Jesus Christ was indeed the Messiah. But they didn't do that. In fact, they hid behind their self-righteousness. They hid behind their religion. And they rejected the truth once again. Once again, they rejected the truth. And what that happens, what happens to our heart when our, the truth is rejected is our hearts get hardened. They get hardened. It wasn't hardened against Paul. They didn't like Paul, obviously. But they really, ultimately, their hearts were hardened towards God. And so we need to be tender towards the truth. When we hear the truth, we need to respond with tender hearts. So then we go into, we have a delayed verdict. 
Now, Felix hears all these things, and we go into verses 22 through the end of the chapter. And in 22, it says, but Felix, having a rather accurate knowledge of the way, put them off, saying, when uh, Lysias, the tribune, comes down, I will decide your case. And then he gave orders to the centurion that he should be kept in custody, but have some liberty. Now, it's interesting. Felix had been a slave in the past, but now he's a free man. And his um, his um, time or term as a governor is really characterized by corruption and bribery and dishonesty. And now he faces a difficult decision. See, it's a it's a difficult decision because he has the Jews, which he wants to please. And, and he has Paul here, he, who he doesn't find guilty under the Roman law. And so he's trapped between justice and popularity. And so what if he finds Paul not guilty and he lets releases Paul? He's going to incite and infuriate the Jewish leaders. But if he decides um, that Paul is guilty and keeps him in prison, he violates the Roman law. And so he is uh, he's in a hard place. And so what he decides, he says, the best decision of all is to make no decision at all. And so he delays it by adjourning the sentencing and he sentences or keeps Paul in custody. And he actually does it for another two years. So he does that, keeps him in custody just to appease the Jews. So he, during that time, we see that um, in verse 24, after some days, Felix came with his wife, Drusilla, who was Jewish, and he sent for Paul and heard him speak about faith in Christ Jesus. Now, I just want to give you a little bit of background. It's kind of just interesting facts, but the things about Drusilla. So Drusilla was just very young. She had been given away to another king. Uh, to be his wife when she was very young. Um, and she was beautiful. Um, she was the granddaughter um, of Anthony and Cleopatra. So now Felix was struck with her beauty. And so he devised a plan and he used a magician in the midst of that um, to lure her away from her husband. And at the age of 16, Drusilla became Felix's wife. Now she was his third wife. And there is probable uh, cause to believe that he kept all three wives at the same time. So she bore him a son. This is some interesting facts of it. But she, um, And the son was killed in the eruption of Mount uh, Vesuvius. So just some interesting things about Drusilla. But when she came with Felix uh, before Paul uh, to have an, uh, an address with Paul, um, she was not yet 20 years old. But we do think that maybe from some of the manuscripts that she might have been the one who urged Felix to um, seek Paul out and also the one who uh, Felix was able to obtain information about the way because she was a Jewish. So anyway, now Paul speaks to uh, to them and he speaks to them about faith and he speaks to him about three things. And we have to look at these. These are probably the key of this whole passage because he speaks of three things. Now, he spoke of something else that we have to grab a hold of. It's another uh, biblical truth that is a foundation to our faith, and that is the resurrection. The resurrection meaning a general re resurrection in the sense that that what you and I can see here and touch now is is not all there is that when that when we are um, in the grave that there is something that happens after that that there is eternal, there's life afterwards there's a resurrection and so but also specifically the resurrection of Jesus Christ which that is the, what proves there's a resurrection for a general resurrection so Jesus Christ rose again he is a God who is alive and living and so so Paul has already addressed resurrection we're going to look at that a little more deeper but the three things that he says to him he said he talks to him he says he reasoned with them in verse 25 he spoke about faith in verse 24 and reasoned about righteousness and self-control and the coming judgment now we have a response from Felix. Anytime we are presented with the truth, it demands a, a response. It, it does. It requires a response. We see a response in Felix and we talk about missed opportunities. And so we do wonder if he missed an opportunity. But before we move into that too much, let's look at those things that Paul reasoned with Felix about. So if I talk about first the, the resurrection of Jesus Christ, we have to look at that. 
And we have to say that the cross and the resurrection, it is the thing that changed all things. Um, in verse, uh, ch- uh, I'm sorry, let me slow down. First Corinthians 15, 17, if Christ has not been raised, your faith is futile and you are still in your sins. And so the cross is and the resurrection is what changes everything and how timely that we're speaking about that today how timely this is the day that the lord would have walked the road of Cal- to calvary and he would have bore our sins on the cross so that cha- the cross and the resurrection changes everything it is the fulfillment of scripture it is a triumph over sin it is the way of salvation in the cross and the resurrection jesus christ defeated death Death that came to us because of the sin that came to mankind. So it's through the cross and the resurrection that there is forgiveness of sin. And that is given to us. And then there is through the resurrection, that power that raised Jesus Christ from the dead is the power that dwells within us as believers that allows us to overcome the bondage of sin. It gives us the power to walk in righteousness. And so then we move into Paul talked about. So he says righteousness, self-control and judgment. So righteousness, now that's God's standard. God's standard is what defines righteousness. God's standard is the one that defines true righteousness. We don't. It's not religion. It's not tradition. It's, it's not our hopes. It's none of those things. But it is God's standard that defines righteousness. So righteousness is to be right with God. We cannot be right with God when we are still in our sinful state. We can't please God when we are trying to keep the rules, when we're rule keepers. I think I am a a real rule keeper, except maybe when it comes to driving on the road. But, you know, I, 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 I I think of myself as a good girl. I want to do always the right thing. And I cannot, in my own power, do all the right things. I, there is no way that we can, uh, either through religion or good works, there's nothing we can do in ourself to please God, to gain righteousness, to be justified before God, to meet his holy standard. And it's only, it's only through the cross and the resurrection that we are reconciled with God. It is only through that. And when we accept that gift of salvation that is given to us through faith in Jesus Christ, then we are now clothed in the robe of righteousness, which is Christ's righteousness. So Paul talks about resurrection. He talks about the righteousness of God. And then he talks about self-control because self-control control it is our it is our uh, required response it's man's required response to bring us into conformity with god's law now self-control is a characteristic that's dis- displayed when we are empowered by the holy spirit you and i we don't have enough within us we don't have enough um uh, well, i don't know perseverance or um strength or anything else or, or a character to be a, a muster up the self-control. We might be able to do it for a period of time, but it won't last. That self-control that he's talking about here, that Paul talks about in his message in the gospel to Felix, is the self-control that comes only from the, the Holy Spirit. It, the Holy Spirit, when we believe Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior, when we take him by faith, accept him as Lord and Savior, then he says that he sent his Holy Spirit to dwell within us. And when the Holy Spirit dwells within us, then when we allow him to have way in our life, when we give him, um, we surrender our life to him, then we will see the fruit of the Spirit. And the fruit of the Spirit is like love and joy and peace and patience and gentleness and kindness and self-control. And so self-control, it's a characteristic that's displayed when we are empowered by the Holy Spirit. When we come to faith in Christ, then he gives us that power. So to be righteous, to be right with God, um, no amount of man-made effort will ever result in that righteousness. But God, but God, it's a heart that is made right with God through Jesus Christ that bears the fruit of righteousness, which is self-control. So you see how it's all pulling together. Paul talked about resurrection. He talked about righteousness. He talks about self-control. Now he talks about, and lastly, in which he gives the gospel to Felix is judgment. Now Hebrews 9.27 says that it's appointed to men once to die, but after this, the judgment. 
we all, and this is sobering. This is the sobering moment. This is the part where, where Felix, when he heard the gospel, the full truth, he became afraid. And sometimes we will be motivated out of fear to accept the gospel. Sometimes, though, we are motivated out of fear to run from the gospel. And then our hearts are hardened. So we will all, all of mankind will have a divine appointment with our creator. Jesus Christ's resurrection gives proof that there will be a day of judgment. The prophets, uh, the prophets prophesize a day of judgment and God, the son, Jesus Christ will be the judge. All unbelievers will be judged by Christ at the great white throne. Now, the, the Bible is very clear that unbelievers are storing up wrath against themselves and that God will give to each person according to what he has done. But I want you to hear this because all of us at one time were unbelievers. I was one time lost without knowledge and salvation of Jesus Christ. I was an unbeliever. We all come to the cross the same way. And so the unbelievers, God will judge those who come into that moment, not believing in Jesus Christ as the Savior. The greatest sin that we can commit against God is to refuse his gift of salvation that he gave. And that gift of salvation is only through his son, Jesus Christ. Now, believers will also be judged, but we will be judged in a different way. It's called the judgment seat of Christ. And it is a time where, where Christ re looks at our lives and, and see we as believers were held accountable for the things that we do in the name of Christ. And so the things we do in the name of Christ that bring him glory, that brings him that crown that we will lay down before him. Those are the things that, that he will reward us for. And so there will be a final judgment. The question is, on which side will you be? It says in the scriptures that every knee will bow, uh, bend and every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. We will either confess that he is Jesus Christ, my Lord, our Lord, or we will confess that he is the Lord that I have rejected all these years. And so there is a time you are in a moment of time, a divine moment of time. There is a song out by Young and Fire, which I just think it just it just says exactly probably what so many of our young people are saving, saying it says all the cheap thrills were only time wasted. Surely there's a higher way. All of my best friends are sick and pretending we want the truth. So much is missing to give us the real thing. I know it's you. My friends, the real thing is Jesus Christ. It is Jesus Christ. And I want to give you the truth. I want you to hear the truth because this is a divine moment in time and an opportunity that God has given each one of us. The real thing is Jesus Christ. He is the way he is the truth and he is the life and no one comes to the father except through him. And so we have an, an opportunity that will determine eternity. We saw that the religious leaders once again refused to accept the truth and their hearts were hardened towards God. Paul shared the God, whole gospel, resurrection, righteousness, self-control, and judgment with Felix. And we saw that he grew afraid. And so that conviction was won out by fear. It appears that he may have missed a divine opportunity. We don't know for sure, but God knows. And now you and I have a divine opportunity. What will we do with the truth of the gospel that's been presented to us? There comes a moment in time where that truth is given and a response is required. And so Hebrews 3, 7, 8 says, therefore, just as the Holy Spirit says today, if you hear his voice, do not harden your hearts. That's been my prayer is that we will not harden our hearts, whether we know the Lord Jesus Christ, whether we have known him as a child and we've walked away as adults or whether we don't know him at all yet. Now is the day. Don't let your hearts be hardened. So I speak first to my friends who are religious. You believe in God and you've grown up in the church, but you are depending on rule keeping and good works to save you. And we can never be good enough. 
God offers you a way. See, he doesn't want religion. He wants a relationship. He wants a relationship with you and I. And he wants us to walk in righteousness, which only can be found in Jesus Christ. And so God offers you today the way. It is through his son, Jesus Christ. So accept that free gift of salvation. Accept it through faith in Jesus Christ. Now, some of you who are hearing this message today, you consider yourself self-made, that you've never felt a need for God. And my friends, I want you to know that the truth has just now been presented to you and you have been given a divine opportunity. See, the scripture tells us that all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. And now God is calling you. See, self-righteousness will never do it. It has to be the righteousness of Christ that does. So won't you? Won't you bend your knees and confess your sins and receive the forgiveness and salvation that is offered to you? It is only found through faith in Jesus Christ. Now, some of you know the Lord. You've known the Lord maybe when you were a child. But the things of this world, the pursuit of position or wealth or comfort or recreation, those things have drawn you away from the Lord. And in these unprecedented times, I believe God is readjusting our priorities and he's causing us to look at what is important in life, which is what he says in his word. He's causing us to depend on him. And so he's calling to you, my friend, to come back, come back. He's such a good father. He's such a good father. You come back, you confess your sins, you repent. And he is so faithful and gracious and he forgives your, uh, forgives you of your sins. And so call to him, bend your knees, turn back, be restored in relationship with them, with him. And then now, my friends, those of us who are, were one time an unbeliever, maybe even one time religious or one time a believer that's fallen away. But today we are followers of Jesus Christ and we don't, we're not ashamed to admit it. Some of you wonder what divine opportunity am I being given? But I'm telling you, it's a divine un opportunity under the name of COVID-19. Unprecedented times. Some of you are waking up with anxiety. I can relate to that. And we have a divine opportunity to overcome fear with faith. Some of us, and I relate to this as well, have lost loved ones in the midst of this time. Now, I lost a loved one, not to COVID, but it was unexpected and it was full of sorrow. And you can't even gather together, sorry, to comfort one another say goodbye so we who have hope have an opportunity to share that hope with others we have an opportunity to give comfort even though we are sheltering in place this is a divine opportunity there are those this is an opportunity for us to be on our knees to share our faith, to pray with power, to pray for in power for our nation, for our families, for our friends. It's an opportunity for us to share hope and faith. God is offering us an opportunity, a divine opportunity, a moment in time to join him in what he is doing in this history making moment. And so see where God is working and then join in, ask him what he wants you to do, what you can do. And I implore you, don't miss this opportunity before you. God is moving. He is moving. So now we need to join him. So let me close with this prayer from Ephesians. It says, now to him who is able to do far more abundantly than all that we ask or think, according to the power at work within us, to him be the glory in the church and in Christ Jesus throughout all generations forever and ever. Amen. Father, I thank you for this moment in time. I thank you that you are moving in ways that we have never seen before. 
I say these are unprecedented times, and I believe that there'll be a display of unprecedented power. But I know that you have displayed that power in the in the history in the past. It's just that we've not seen it in the Western world like that. And so we are asking that you display your powers in mighty ways, that you heal, that you restore, that you bring people into salvation. Father, that you heal our land. And we believe these things because we believe that you are in control in the midst of this. So we give you praise that you are in control. I pray that you would bless and keep each one that hears this message, that you would draw near, that just as with Paul, where you stood beside him and you said to him, take courage, may they feel your presence in ways that they have never felt before. I pray this all in the mighty and the powerful name of Jesus Christ. Amen. My friends, thank you for joining me and please come back next week as well.